Hello, and welcome to Portfolio Matters Weekly Update, week 56. And it's been another busy week in the markets. Thank you to Richard and Stuart for doing last week's while well, I was away skiing, which was very nice. But now I'm back and we have a packed program for you today. But before we get into it, Richard will read the disclaimer. Thank you, Keith. I'm glad you came back in one piece. Everything discussed during the Portfolio Matters podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Listeners should be aware that we will be discussing securities that we own or have a financial interest in. Please do your own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. A full disclaimer can be found at the end. Keith, what have you got this week? Well, it was a packed week. So first of all, the Bank of England has realized that it is way behind the curve on inflation and is trying to catch up. So it raised rates for the second meeting in a row and interest rates are now 0.5% when we will see, show you a chart in a, a bit, they're forecasting UK inflation, that's CPI, not RPI, to peak above 7% this year. In this week's ECB meeting, Christine Lagarde refused to rule out raising interest rates in 2022, causing a bond market sell-off. Now, reminder, the EU is still doing QE. The Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program is due to end in March. And EU inflation this week in the Eurozone unexpectedly came in hot came in at 5.1%, and the ECB still has rates at zero and is still doing QE. I'm slightly mystified as to why it was unexpected, Keith, but uh, perhaps they don't watch portfolio matters. Well, exactly. You know, honestly, Richard, as we go through this, regular viewers will know we've been banging on about energy prices and inflation and central banks being behind the curve and using emollient language to try and talk it down. What's happened to transitory for yeah. the past year? And finally, the eggheads at the central banks are catching up. Perhaps they've been watching us, Richard. Anyway, um, in the UK, while we talk about energy, the energy cap is due to rise by 54% in April from the current 1,277 pounds to two grand. And the expectations are that it will rise further in October to around 2,450 pounds per household. So that is inherently deflationary because that's gonna suck money out of people's pockets. So the energy crisis, which we've been flagging for a long time is now really starting to hit, will start to hit consumers' wallets. Yesterday, Facebook fell by 26%. And another regular theme on in Portfolio Matters has been to avoid very overpriced US growth companies. And finally, Russia didn't attack Ukraine, thankfully, this week. Okay, so going through some economic data. Okay, so we're going to concentrate on Three data items. If you want to read the whole table, please pause and have a look. Okay, so number one, the US JOLTS job openings came in strong, so exceeded forecasts. It came in at 10.925 million, which was well above expectations. We go further down the table, the second piece of data I want to talk about is the ADP employment change for January, which showed the US actually lost jobs, unexpectedly lost 300,000 jobs when the expectation was the jobs market would keep on growing. Now, so we've got a, getting some contradictory data here, but as we show, go through the chart pack, you will see that I think that the job losses in January were caused by Omicron and have now passed. And the underlying US employment market is very strong. So 
the Jolt's job openings is a kind of historic number now, but you still have a lot of job openings in the US as of December. And the big question this year is, are workers who have left the workforce because of COVID going to come back in and ease the job shortage? Because right now, the Fed is behind the curve. The job market is tight, and that is leading to wage inflation. And if that continues, you could get a wage price spiral. And the final piece of data is EU CPI, which economists had been forecasting to fall in January, and it came in hot. It actually, so economists have been forecasting a figure of 4.5%, which would have been well down on December's 5.0%, but it came in hot, came in at 5.1% up on December and well above expectations. That would have been one of those lines that goes up like this, followed by economists' projection. At yes, <laughs> we have a few of those coming up, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, some quarterly numbers. Now, interesting numbers from Germany. So German Q4 GDP actually fell quite sharply by 0.7% quarter on quarter, whereas the Eurozone as a whole had decent growth. The Eurozone number is, is year annualized. So the supply chain disruptions are having quite big effects in Germany. But again, I expect those to be transitory. Okay, let's go through some charts, Richard. So the, uh, the Euro two year swap rate after Christine Lagarde's comments, so it's a huge spike up. Um, where she didn't rule out interest rate rises. Now, any sentient being would think that interest rate rises are an absolute essential given the inflation environment. So the swap market to respond like this when they're not ruled out just shows what a bizarre sort of Alice in Wonderland world we're living in. Um, mm. I don't know whether the, uh, whether the swap rate has any particular significant consequence on the real economy or whether it's at, at the moment it's more an indicator of the way institutions and bond um, institutions and currency traders are thinking. Well, it's, you know, these are derived from bond rates. And except, but if you look at the absolute number, it's like zero, gone to zero, the two year rate's gone to zero. But, yeah. you know, one thing we're going to talk about in subsequent weeks, we have got a packed program today, so we're not gonna cover it in detail, is that I really question whether the eurozone can actually survive rising interest rates or even the reduction in QE, because QE has had the effect of reducing the differentials between Italian and Greek bond yields and German bond yields. And I've got a chart later showing you the increase in Italian indebtedness over the course of COVID, and it's been really quite marked. Italy has now has the second highest government debt to GDP in the world. And if the interest rates charged on that debt start to rise, Italy's in big trouble. Oh. So um, I'm sure we'll discuss that as we go through, Keith, as you say. So German GDP shrinking. And German CPI is still tick down. The EU CPI is not, not ticking down and um, it's looking like it's in a strong uptrend, which is what personally I believe it is. Uh, the US employment costs, uh, that's interesting. Is that, what's that showing us? So the quarter on quarter increase in US yeah. employment costs is falling. Well, it's actually, it was down slightly, but when you look at it in the long term, and this is all the data they've got, yeah. you know. It's relatively it's high, isn't high. it? Yeah, and, and given that we know that the end of the quarter was rather affected by COVID, then. So if we were to go into a wage price spiral, we would expect to see that histogram rising up to the right every quarter. Yeah. 
a US ISM manufacturing index. New orders. Still strong, but coming down. Yeah. The prices paid index uh, came down a bit, but now was ticked back up. Yeah. So when we previously covered this chart, it looked like the inflationary pressures were fading. Well, we spoke too soon. It's bouncing back up. And the uh, manufacturing employment index is still looking healthy. Job openings is looking, um, it's, it's looking fairly stable actually, which suggests that uh, as Keith says, the US economy is doing well and there are more uh, openings than there are people wishing to fill them. But also just look at the step change for like post COVID from pre COVID. I mean, yeah. really, there are loads of companies looking for jobs, and that is in inherently inflationary. Yeah. And the uh, quips rate is uh, still very high and basically looks like it's just worth moving around that steep upwards trend, which is indicative of a very tight employment market, people moving for higher wages. And the ADP employment change, which is, I think this is what you referred to probably, Keith, as the, the effect of Omicron which will then flush out of the system. Mm. Because Yes, and on that note, this chart is weekly. And so you see that in January, there was this tick up in jobless claims, and now it's fading again. So I think that the pick up in unemployment in January was transi transient, and is now fading and we the jobs market in the us remains very strong like you keith i loathe the word transitory i'm not even sure it's a real word no it is but it's just completely misused intentionally misused by central banks transitory um, applies to natural effects where you know what the end is it's like phases of the moon you know you know that it's going to got a certain periodicity like the tides. Uh, I see. So yes, I mean, I was thinking it, that it referred to, that's very interesting, as opposed to the, the, the transient, which is we know it, we think it's mm. going to pass, but we don't know when. Yes, and, yes. Uh, so we've discussed this before, but absolutely, they should have used the word transitory. Sorry, of course, everything they, sorry. Transient. they should have used the word transient, not transitory. Every, everything's transient, sadly. Well, mm. maybe not sadly, it depends <laughs> what it is. But. <laughs> Uh, China manufacturing PMI, stable. Uh, and uh, another China manufacturing PMI from different sources, also stable. Well, this one shows quite a big drop, actually, I'm afraid. Last well, month, depends where you take the, it depends what you take the mean as, really, Keith, doesn't it? Yeah. If you go back to 2014, you know, yeah. it's it's round about the just 50-ish level. So Yeah. It's, what's so, interesting yeah. about this chart, Richard? Is the fact that you know during this period 2012 to 2016 when you know that the us the chinese economy was growing very strongly actually the kaijin manufacturing pmi was negative but well, below 50 which doesn't make any sense at all so that's a really good point <laughs> so how much use is this as a predictive for well it just i you know i think it says what um chinese manufacturing company owners think about conditions and they maybe have a pessimistic bias basically yeah. okay mortgage approvals which have been falling quite steeply actually just ticked up a little bit but you know, we don't know whether that's uh, just a seasonal effect or whether that's a continuing change uk mortgage lending uh very very volatile um, mm. but now down to round about the level it was at pre-covid yeah, it's astonishingly volatile recently. The EU unemployment rate is still dropping. That looks good. And, that is uh, a very good looking chart. Yeah, it is. OK, and on to Inflation Watch. Well, we had some new bits of data this week. So EU inflation came in hot. German inflation was 4.9%. You know, Bear in mind, the ECB has got a 2% mandate and EU inflation beat all expectations. Well, they kept interest rates at zero. Now, 
we have covered this chart previously, which shows the Bank of England's inflation forecasts at various points in the year. So the red line is where they thought inflation would be in May. And then the blue line is what actually happened. So inflation kept on rising. But the Bank of England have continually forecast it was going to peak and then been surprised by continued inflation strength. And the latest one, Keith? And the latest one <laughs> is here. So finally, the Bank of England have started listening to Portfolio Matters and have yeah, found they've relief. Stretched, they've stretched it out a bit, haven't they? They've really, um, they've gone to town on that one. They've given it, taken it all the way up to 7%. But yeah. when it hits 7%, it's going to be dropping off at 45, at 90 degrees. Why do they always drop off at bloody 90 degrees? You know, why can't they be... <laughs> oh. That... <laughs> They've got a set of protractors and <laughs> it always has the same angle, Richard. But, you know, really, they've, um, they've now gone big. I mean, now they're forecasting inflation, that's CPI, not RPI, to go above 7%. But also, there's, yeah. a, there's a spurious accuracy in this. If you go to, like, mid-2023, it, the, mm. the rate of decline is going to slow fairly significantly for about three months, and then it's going to speed up. But then if you look at what was going to happen in, in um, late 2021, and you think, why would you believe any of this? Well, it also, as you say, it conveniently comes down towards the Bank of England's target. Yeah. You know, so the implication is we don't have to do anything because it will naturally come back down towards our target level. The other thing I found rather offensive about Andrew Bailey is that he's telling telling people that they have to exercise wage moderation. I actually don't know what he earns, but I think it's so wholly inappropriate for him to suggest that to when people like hospital cleaners are, are having to survive with no pay rise and food inflation, mm. of, you know, uh, uh, food and energy inflation, very significant levels. I mean, the hypocrisy is appalling. Mm. Personal view. Yeah. Well. The, um, so, will the Bank of England have to raise rates quickly? Well, they're starting. Um, if they've raised rates twice in a row, to a so course, massive 0.5 percent, when they're expecting inflation to hit seven. And the question is: Is um, to what, what degree can the economy withstand interest rate increases? Mm. It'd be interesting to see what happens to property prices over the next few months. Now, well, uh, more on that in a bit, Richard. Okay, so the labour markets in the UK, as in the US, are very tight. And we're already seeing intimations of industrial action in various sectors. And that is only going to get worse when the energy bills start to hit and people start taking a real hit to their living standards. And in a tight labour market, you would expect people to start demanding inflationary wage rises. And because of the high inflation, although wages have been rising, real wage growth is negative. And that is now, and that is before we get the rises in energy and national insurance. And the, the rising energy bills will hit the poor hardest. Yeah. And so we are seeing Wage, strong wage growth in certain sectors of the UK, but mainly in the low skilled food preparation service construction sectors and professional services actually have had Ooh. negative growth, um, wage growth. These are advertised pay rates for job postings. And the US market is also looking very tight. Now, these are normalized, so quite difficult to interpret. But what you're seeing is it looks like the US employment market is already quite tight. Now, remember that the Fed has previously stated that it won't start raising interest rates until the unemployment rate reached 3.5%. Now, we're already seeing inflation, wage inflation in the US, and 
uh, rates in the US are still currently zero. So do, is their model wrong? Is their estimate of NERU, the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, too low? And you see here that this is the long-term trend of nominal wages in the US, and it seems we've got a break. Real wages are actually declining. So as a result of that, well, the Bank of America is forecasting US interest rates to really start climbing rapidly, faster than the market is currently anticipating. And that would be very bad for growth stocks and for bonds. So as we have talked about many times previously, two sectors that you might uh, wish to avoid. Yeah, until they... Um they cease to hike rates and start restart QE and then there will be sectors to go back into. Yeah, that's true. And inflation expectations are still rising in the US. They are now on the five year, 10 year, so five to 10 year inflation expectations, expectations of 3.1% and not coming down. And Inflation forecasts for next year are moving towards 5%. So you would expect US workers start demanding 5% wage rises. Okay, now on to Richard's point earlier about the housing market. Now, last week, Richard and Stuart featured this chart, which is the Case-Shiller US House Price Index. And that ran until November. But as we've talked about, interest rates are rising. So mortgage rates are also rising. And so the 15 year, which is the best proxy for average US mortgage rates, has risen from a low of 2.1% in 2021 to 2.8% now. So that is up a third. And as we've previously discussed on the weekly, the maximum value you can put on a house, the maximum pe people can afford to borrow to pay for a house is just a function of interest rates. So as interest rates rise, so you'd expect the housing market to fall. And so this is the 30-year the rate. And this is the latest house price index from the St. Louis Fed. And you'll see it's saying the median US house price fell by 9.2% in December. Now that is a big fall. If, if you go back to the previous graph, please. So let's say the interest rate now is, is what it was in 2016. What were, and then you go back to the previous graph mm. again. So in 2016, house prices were at 170, let's say, They're currently at 270. So in fact, this is where you would expect them to fall to. Yes, would good point. From 170 to 289, which would be a 33% fall mm. at the current rate of interest. Yeah. Well, it'd be slightly less than that because of the, the uh, um, wages, etc., have increased over the period, but it'd be a substantial fall. Maybe 25. Mm. So well, let's see whether that happens. It'd be interesting to see whether that actually plays out. Yeah. But... The other thing I want to say is if you look at transaction volumes, they actually haven't fallen. They're picked up. And so it just seems like the market is just naturally clearing and adjusting to mm, higher yeah. interest rates, but that's not impacting transaction volumes. And if we look at the number of new homes sold in January, they actually picked up. So it looks like the housing market is just naturally adjusting to mm. rising interest rates, but it's not actually affecting underlying activity. And that is good. OK, moving on to the yield curve. Now, we know that bond rates are a good predictor of market slowdowns and coming recessions. And there has been a bit of discussion on Twitter about whether changes in the yield curve are now predicting a recession. 
for example, this terrible chart here, which somebody was showing, which is actually a difference between the five and 30. But actually the most widely used predictor is the difference between the 10 year and the three month. And that is showing no concerns whatsoever as of the 14th of January. So this is more recent data up to the 28th. But basically, the yield curve is not showing any concerns about recession. So that's reassuring. Richard. So ARK Innovation ETF, we covered this sort of on pass on a, on a couple of occasions. So just a little bit more of a look at it. So the ARK Innovation ETF um, sort. In fact, there, there's about half a dozen of these things. And the ARK Innovation, I think, is their flagship, but there, mm -hmm. there are there are four or five others uh, which cover various sort of aspects of, of technology. Um, well, so this one, I think, is just a bit more generalist. So Berkshire Hathaway from quarter one, 2020, ARK Innovation soared 300%, and now it's back down to where Berkshire Hathaway was. So um, they have, uh, timing is everything in it. When, you come, when it comes to investing in ARC, I think we can say. And every holding apart from one, which is um, gene editing company, Intelia Therapeutics, uh, every company apart from that is down. And I think there are a couple of other, from memory, a couple of other gene editing or biotech type companies in the, the ones that are down. And um, the, uh, you know, some of the losses are very substantial indeed, aren't they? 75, 80. Uh, and even 90%. And um, even some of the sort of more mainstream shares like Twitter, which is down uh, 35 or 40%. And it has been across the board carnage in the tech sector. But of course, what this graph shows is that the um, revenue growth is, uh, is, is really quite substantial in many of their holdings. Um, and you know, I don't know what the median is. It's like in the seventy percentage, isn't it? In the, the lowest, uh, there's some low ones, but it, yeah, forty percent at plus is normal, and that suggests that there is value to be had, but only if you're paying the right price. And um, the question is, where where is the right price to enter into a basket of these very fast growing companies. And if we look at this chart, back in the beginning of 2020, the price was 35, it's now 65. Uh, it's dropped from 160, which means that it's down about 80%. No, sorry, it's down about 70, 65%. Can't do this on in my head. Um, and what would be a good price to buy it? this basket of high growth shares is the question mm. and we don't know um but looking at that graph you might think it's a little bit lower than where it currently is yeah wouldn't touch it interest rates rising and um generally when there's a big sell-off like this it tends to overshoot to the downside yeah but at some point it, it will be it may be a buy well that's right i mean the, the her fundamental thesis that these are very fast going growing companies has been absolutely right. If you look at the revenue growth, you know, very impressive. But yeah. there are no bad assets, just bad prices. Yeah, this is a very interesting uh, graph, which uh, shows, shows that the pale blue line, Goldman of unprofitable tech index, which is basically halved in the last uh, two to three months. Uh, the NASDAQ composite and the Russell 3000 are down well, plus or minus 10%, around 10% each. So the um, yeah. There clearly needs to be a reconsideration of the investment thesis into unprofitable tech, and it got way, way ahead of itself. Um, whether it drops back down to the point where it is investable again remains to be seen. Yeah. But it, it's not yet. Well, again, something we've covered extensively in the weeklies the um, yeah. bubble in US tech. Yeah. And. Uh, and we can see the NASDAQ is down, um, what's it down, it's like 40% from its high. Mm. And um, it's still higher than it ever was 
since 2007. If it normalizes into that graph, it's going to, it's got another 25% drop, take it down to a price a perspective price earning ratio of 20. Um, whether it does or not remains to be seen. As Keith says, interest rates going up are they are going to be the um, catalyst that force it that make it make it go lower. So and you know the general yeah. trend at the moment of interest rates is undoubtedly up or down. So the Nasdaq is not really a place to be at the moment, I think. Yeah, I would be very very cautious about catching a falling knife. Interest rates rising, and you know. When the air starts to deflate from these bubbles in very expensive growth stocks with actually which have high earning, high revenue growth, but no earnings, no cash flows being paid out to investors. I mean, you have no fundamental underpinnings to the valuation. It could go anywhere. So I would really wait until it bottoms and that could take quite a long time. Yeah. Now. This is really interesting. Okay, so this is the performance of the S&P 500 intraday or overnight. Yeah, so overnight means taking the price at the close to the open the next morning. Yeah, and you'll see that almost all the returns of the S&P 500 occur after it's closed. Now, what is going on? So there were various theories. Number one is pointed out that stock markets only open for eight hours a day. And so it's closed for 16. And, you know, stocks should report, um, respond to news. And therefore, you know, two thirds of the news from around the world will occur when the market's closed. And that explains some of it. Not convinced, really. A lot of the information comes out during the day when people are moving around. If you're a US company, you mainly care, care about US news, and that surely comes out during the day. Now, regulators have observed that the big movement in S&P 500 futures tends to occur between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. in New York, which is when European traders come in. So part of it can be explained by European traders reacting to latest developments. But I think the main cause of this is that companies announce their earnings either after the close or before the open. So the open the next day um, discounts the news. And we know that the game Wall Street plays is it walks down earnings expectations so that companies can beat them. And then so you have this systematic inflow of good news overnight. But the reason this article was in the FT was somebody has a theory that it is evil hedge funds that are manipulating the overnight changes in share prices. So what's happening is that Hedge funds which own a big position in stock Y buy loads of it overnight in very thin markets and move the price. And then they unwind that their extra positions they're bought overnight during the day when there's a lot less, a lot more liquidity. And essentially the price movements they've caused overnight are not fully unwound during the day and that allows them to profit. The FT was very skeptical, but anyway. Okay, and finally, we are entering a period now when interest rates are rising. And there are three things to look out for. Economic headwinds that affect emerging markets, but affect everything. The first one is a rising US dollar. Now, as the US starts to raise interest rates, we should expect to see the US dollar strengthening or else being equal. And that started to happen. And we know a lot of emerging markets have added a lot of debt during the pandemic. So you could well see problems there. Argentina is a very good example of what's happening right now. Secondly, interest rates are rising. So all that debt that um, 
increases the interest rate, pay, interest payments you have to pay on it, and the price at which you have to refinance. That all sucks demand out and increases um, financial stress. And finally, so rising oil prices are a big cause of inflation. And inflation on its own is actually deflationary. And we're seeing that in the UK now, where people are, consumers are getting high energy price bills, and they're going to have to divert some of their normal expenditure to paying for energy. It is only inflationary if consumers and workers demand compensatory wage rises. Without that, rising energy prices are deflationary. So this is something to watch. Will workers manage to get inflationary pay rises? And that would cause a wage price spiral. But these three things are actually sucking demand out of the economy. You've got rising dollar, rising rates, rising energy. But also, I'd just like to point out, is if you look at the... Um the dollar index from 2010 or so, it's, it's actually been in a broad range for since 2014, right. uh, between about 90 and 105. And um, I, I think that uh, sometimes, it, you know, it's possible to have over analysis of, of, of these things. Mm. My view is until it breaks out of that range, which would signify some sort of fundamental change in the way people are thinking, how they have been thinking over the last um, eight or nine years, that it's just it's just moving around and um, its impact is probably going to be relatively mm. low. I mean, you get a lot of people saying gold isn't going up because the dollar index is rising, but you know the dollar, as you can even see from here, you know, the dollar index is, is even on this small scale, it's moving between 90 and 102. So I do think that there's a, you know, People try to attribute all sorts of things mm. to the dollar index, but actually, the dollar index just moves around. So, mm. yeah, I'd, I'd also say, Richard, that in previous weeks, we have discussed the, the fact that the US is running an enormous record current account deficit, which yeah. has been financed by inflows, which we attributed to inflows into the stock market. Now, yeah. if the NASDAQ latest Nasdaq bubble starts to deflate and people start drawing their money out, then you could see a collapse in the dollar. So, okay. And finally, on to US, latest US economic data. And I saw this, and this is not good. Okay, so this is the Atlanta Fed's GDP now forecast for Q1 2022. And they're essentially saying, there's not going to be any growth. Not good. Mm. But if you look into it, actually, the underlying data is slightly more reassuring because a big um, detraction from economic growth is the rise in inventories, which we have been discussing previously, that as the supply chain um, congestion eases, you'll get a load of inventory coming out of the supply chain, which will temporarily depress economic growth. And it looks like that's what's expected to happen in January. But the rest of the contributors to economic growth look fairly healthy. Without that drop in private inventories, GDP would be pretty good. Um, but the Citigroup Economic surprise index is currently close to zero. Something to watch. And we're now going to go through some, some contemporaneous indicators of the US economy. So this is air travel. The red line is 2022. Obviously, there's various COVID disruptions in the US at the moment. So it's well down on 2019. But actually, a lot decently above 2021 and uh so it's 2020 was the start of covid wasn't it? i'm getting lost now restaurant bookings took a big hit in december and january 
we look at New York, which is the dark, this uh, bottom line here, the kind of gray blue line, you'll see there's a big drop from minus 20 to around minus 50. So unsurprisingly, the return of Omicron has hit the service sector. And you'll see that also in cinema attendance. So the red line is here. Hotel occupancy though looks all right. That's a look pretty much back to normal. So that's quite reassuring. And Apple mobility data, so people looking for maps, etc., shows again that Omicron has had a big effect, but people are starting to move again. So that is reassuring. So this explains why we've had a big, a bit of a knock to employment in January, but things look like they were recovering. Although subway usage in the US and the UK, it looks like there's a structural break. People are not going to be going back to the office as much. They'll be doing more re re remote working. Okay, and finally onto other charts. I read, I read yesterday that the um, reduction in export of uh, steel by China is significant. And as a consequence, a particular shipping index that transports that material has plummeted. Mm. And um, I, think, I think we're seeing, um, I think you still need to break up the shipping industry apart because the last week, the week before, we looked at the Baltic Dry Index. Mm. The Baltic Dry Index is also dropping very fast. May, that may be the same index as uh, reflects uh, steel exports from China. And you, so we've got the world in two parts, haven't we? We've got container ships where clearly supply chain issues, unloading issues, it appears to be unloading issues, doesn't it, of course, um, are maintained. And uh, obviously that dam damages the supply chain. And then the other part of the shipping industry is there seems to be less movement of raw materials, uh, hence the drop in the Baltic dry index. And uh, the drop in the Baltic dry index suggests the world trade might be slowing, but that is contradictory in terms of supply chain problems. So it's really quite hard to tell where we are, I think. Mm. What do you think, Keith? I agree with you about the um, drop in the Baltic dry index, which is surprising. But I mean, this chart is clearly showing that you're still having supply chain problems in the US. Lots of ships queued up and as we've discussed before i mean the just the volume of world trade is overwhelming the infrastructure and you know increasing port capacity is something which would take a lot of time and investment and what we're seeing here is that you know the increase in world trade is just um is causing congestion which shows no sign of um easing anytime soon and we don't know to what extent this congestion has been worsened by COVID operating processes being less efficient. True. If at all, you know, we, we just don't know. Yeah. And the US five year junk credit spread is indicating that people are getting concerned that junk credit may not be such a safe investment as they thought it was. So, um, and, and the junk market has been incredibly, I think, underpriced in terms of the interest rates mm. that uh, companies could sell their junk rated credit for. Uh, it's been far too low to represent the, the risk. And uh, maybe uh, it looks to what it looks definitely looks as if people are coming to revalue that. And that again, that it has two impacts. It, it makes junk credit harder to raise, and some businesses are actually reliant on junk credit in order to stay afloat. So mm. there may well be a knock-on effect on the margins there of increased level of bankruptcy. Yeah. I mean, we know that during the uh, last couple of years, EU junk bond yields went to zero. Yeah. And so, I mean, you know that's the wrong price. Uh, yeah. Astonishing. So moving on to COVID. This is interesting. It, when we were first exposed to COVID, it, it was more than 10 times leaf, as lethal as flu for the most vulnerable. Um, and um, now it is uh, with the Omicron variant, 
it is much less dangerous and also with a little bit of herd immunity, the vaccinations and so forth. And um, so I mean, whether it's really more dangerous for the under 50s or whether that's some sort of spurious statistical mm. um, outcome, but effectively uh, COVID as we now have it is much less dangerous than um, the original variant. And I, I read this morning, uh, some, one, some, uh, one of the senior public health officials in South Africa, uh, where Omicron first originated, said he, said he said the obsession with numbers of infections was incredibly damaging. All mm. you had to do was look at hospitalization rates in South Africa. So basically, it was highly critical of the way that Europe approached Omicron. And uh, in fact, with the way the scientists assessed the approach to Omicron, which I endorse absolutely. Uh, and I think I also read that um, there's a paper by Johns Hopkins, uh, which I haven't read, but I have downloaded. But in essence, um, what it says, I believe, is that taken in their entirety, lockdowns cause more damage than, than uh, not locking down would have caused because of the un unintended consequences of lockdown in terms of health, mental health, economic damage, damage to education, damage to, to childhood development and so forth. Yeah. And their thesis is lockdowns are not an appropriate response to this. Yes. Uh, there is this new Omicron variant, the B2, BA2, and um, that it appears to be more infectious than the original Omicron variant, which as we know is something like 10 times more infectious than the original, um, than the original COVID that we had, but it doesn't appear to be any more dangerous. And it is, the reason it's a variant of Omicron too, Omicron um, is that Omicron has a lot of mutations on its spike and then this new variant has a few additional variations. So it's much more like Omicron than it is like the um, original uh, coronavirus. And um, I also read today that there is a very dangerous version of HIV out, which is um, much more damaging to the human immune system if, if one's infected, but it's not dangerous because the HIV treatment is still effective. So it's only dangerous if you're not treated. And I think that rather sort of puts the lie to the fact that these viruses only ever mutate in a more benign way. So right. this HIV virus has, has mutated in a malign way, but we have effective treatments for it. Important thing about the latest variant, Richard, is that if you look at Denmark, the cases have gone through the roof, but the deaths and the number of people in ICU remain quite low. And yeah. the Danes have lifted all coronavirus restrictions. My God, yeah. they don't I have think... SAGE. They, don't, they need Radio 4 to tell them what to do. <laughs> and we, um, I mean, the other, the other confusing element, um, a confounding element is the fact that when Omicron is so, so prevalent in the population, dying with Omicron is very different mm. to dying from Omicron. And we don't differentiate that in the stats. Oh, right. So, well, I thought this was uh, ironic, frankly, that the World Health Organization was berating everybody for not having enough uh, masks and for not, uh, you know, for, for generally bad, badly managing everything, that the, the press was berating the government for not having enough disposables. Everybody was berating everybody for not having enough planetary pollutants. And you just need to walk down the street and you see masks literally everywhere. Mm. And um, the, uh, you know, the number of... Uh, the number of um, lateral flow tests that are being thrown away, obviously after they've been done, I assume, yeah. um, it's been incredibly wasteful. And my question actually is, why, do, why doesn't the health service go back to using reusable materials and washing them and putting them in autoclaves to, to sterilise them? And it may be more expensive in terms of, of per item, but you're not wasting this vast quantities of equipment, vast quantities of equipment. I simply don't understand it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right. Any new confirmed COVID-19 cases per million people. I mean, I think what we've basically said is this is, okay, it has peaked, but this, this stat is irrelevant. It's like daily new, new cases of the common cold. Yeah. It's an irrelevant statistic. Yeah. But anyway, good news. But good news, yes, right. because it's become irrelevant. Yeah. Fingers crossed it remains. So. Well, fingers crossed, mate. 
fingers crossed we can allow to go on holiday and stuff now anyway um so week in the markets well actually strangely a decent week despite the shenanigans yesterday with um meta falling 25 percent and a big fall in the s p actually generally despite the fact the s p fell 2.4 percent it's up 2.9 percent since last week's episode which is amazing the nasdaq however fell 2.2 percent FTSE all share was all right bitcoin had a bounce though still heavily down on the year and this is meta i.e facebook as Rich was saying earlier, that is the biggest loss of um, equity value in a single day in history by a single company. And one thing we've talked about previously is the lack of liquidity. So the light blue line is depth, market depth. That is not great. And the dark blue line at the top here is tick width. So the difference between the bid offer spread, and you see it's actually taken quite a dip. This was in the sell off recently. <clears throat> and you know, there is a lack of liquidity depth in the market. So when you have news, you have really dramatic moves in prices. These markets are much more volatile now. And that's something to be aware of if you're an equity investor. Now, this chart shows earnings estimates, their, their path over the last few months. And you'll see that the dark black line here is earnings for Q4 2021. And the red line is Q1 2022. And revisions were very strongly positive for the last quarter of last year but they're drifting off for the first quarter of this year, which is concerning. Essentially, my forecasters are downgrading expectations for earning growth, and it's actually negative. Investors are worried about market volatility, so there's a record volume of puts out there. The time, the time to buy the, your puts was, was um, mm. uh, prior to that. Um, big increase in notional outstanding. Yeah. So when vol was low is when you want to buy puts, not when vol's gone through the roof. Yeah. Um, and this is the relative performance of value over growth. And you see, value has had a terrible few years and it's just started to tick up and it's ticking up strongly. But potentially, there's a long way to go. Stay long value. So this is uh, showing that the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust is trading at a discount to net asset value and 24.9% um, discount. So if you want to get your Bitcoin on the cheap, you know, then get them now, uh, as long as they don't fall in price from that point forward, of course. Um, but it's interesting, isn't it, that the, uh, it has such a large discount. Well, this is a really asset. good indicator of, of investor sentiment towards Bitcoin. You know, back a while ago, it was trading a hundred percent premium, which is as unsophisticated investors who didn't couldn't actually didn't want to buy Bitcoin, yeah. could buy Bitcoin via this listed vehicle and willing to pay double, and now they'll only buy it at a twenty five percent discount. It's quite interesting. It actually did go into um, a discount at around about the top of the market. Mm. Yes, very good point. Moving on to energy commodities. Okay, so oil had a strong week, up 3.6%. Natural gas, EU, EU natural gas futures came off. And that is great news. And we'll show you the Russia has started pumping gas again into Europe, which is great. Um, coal and uranium drifted slightly lower. So this is crude, which is going through the roof and looks frankly overboard um now interesting is that japan's oil consumption has been declining you'll see that it's actually come down quite a long way 
in the last two decades. So an aging population basically means less energy is required. And that portends what could happen to Europe with its own energy aging population in the coming years. So we might expect Europe's oil <coughs> demands to fall. And this is the EIA's forecast for OPEC production for the coming year. Now, what's interesting is if you look at the raw numbers, they're forecasting an increase in 1.1 million barrels a day, but they're still expecting OPEC to retain quite a lot of spare capacity. And that's, isn't that contradictory? They have the spare capacity and oil prices are $90 when you expect them to pump. And we know that OPEC have been struggling to meet the increase in quota. So every month currently, OPEC are due to increase their production by 400,000 barrels a day, but they haven't been doing that because a lot of members don't actually have the spare capacity. So this is what we were talking about. This is how far below target OPEC plus R, and you'll see that if zero here is their target, they are the best part of 750,000 barrels below it. So they, they just can't produce as much as they would like to, and that's bullish. Now, regular viewers will know that I have a big position in hunting PLC, which is an oil service company. And that has been a very disappointing investment because the oil service sector has not recovered and hunting's revenues have been disappointing. Now, one of the reasons for that is that during the lockdown, the shale oil drillers kept on drilling and built up a big inventory of drilled but uncompleted wells and they have since then been drawing those down so they've been completing these wells and so they haven't been drilling that many new wells not as many wells as they should but the no number of drilled uncompleted wells is now rapidly declining so they're going to have to get back to drilling, and that is good for oil service companies. So I've recently been adding to my hunting position because this can't continue. At the current tra trajectory, they will run out of drilled uncompleted wells within the next 18 months. And the number of drilled uncompleted wells is already below the average for the last cycle. So they're really going to have to get the rigs out quite soon. And JP Morgan are forecasting Brent to hit $125 in 2022 and then 150 in 2023. We like these sort of forecasts and we hope they'll come true. Well, um, Keith, if they do come true, what will happen to economic growth? Because well, your, your other main, one of your other major theses, which is held out historically to be correct, is that high oil prices cause recessions. Yes, it will cause a recession. You need to get out. We will be, as oil heads towards $150, we will start taking off our bet. But, you know, it has Not to yet. get there first, Richard. <laughs> so, anyway, we'll cover all this in the weekly as events unfold. This is Dutch natural gas futures, which have come down a long way from their peak, but remain massively above where they were last year so you know still four times where they were last year and the reason that dutch gas futures came down is that russia started pumping again which is really interesting because i thought russia were meant to be you know invading ukraine and um you know trying to impose economic pain on europe and the fact they've started pumping again to me suggests they're probably not going to invade Ukraine. Mm. Also, Keith, from an economic point of view, they, they put the price up hugely, several hundred percent from what they were getting. And mm. you know, what, 
why not take advantage of that and fill their coffers? Yeah. And I assume that, you know, the Russian economy is quite weak. This must have cost them a lot. Yes, it must. Yeah. And just a point of information, there's a, a handy chart for you to cut away and keep. It shows the uh, various pipelines from Russia into Europe. And so this is Nord Stream, which exists and is in use, and that has a capacity of 55 billion cubic meters per annum. Nord Stream 2, which, you know, very controversial, has been completed but not commissioned yet, and is one of the big um, sticks that the EU is using to uh, beat the uh, Russians with if they invade Ukraine. They're saying they wouldn't commission it. Well, that has an equal capacity. And then we have Yamal, which runs through Poland. And then we've got various pipelines that run through Ukraine. And then from the south, we've got um, Turk Stream and Blue Stream runs to Turkey. Coal remains very elevated. And I thought this is an interesting chart. This is UK coal and gas consumption for power generation. And the UK certainly has done the green transition. But well, if you if you don't count pelleted wind chips. Yes, well, that's true. Yeah. But also when the wind blow, doesn't blow, you know, we we burn a lot of natural gas and recently we've been burning coal again. And uranium seems to have reached a high plateau. Richard. So um, in commodities, a, a mixed week, um, aluminium dropped 1.1%, but it's up 9.5% on the year. And I read uh, yesterday, I think, that Ferrari is struggling with, with its costs because it, Ferrari cars use um, high-grade aluminium for their frames mm. and metal components because it's super light. And uh, with the aluminium price having gone up so much, that's causing a raw material cost problem. Um, the battery metals um, pretty much uh, stable, lithium up a little bit. Uh, iron ore up very significantly, 25% year to date, 7% in the week. Um, and I don't know what's causing that to happen. But you also see that um, ferro-vanadium is following that as I think mm. we've seen in the past where an agent tends to track to some to be correlated to some extent to the price of uh, iron ore. And mm. then uh, tin continuing its multi month advance upwards. Aluminium, and cobalt. The battery metals, yeah, yeah, all very strong. Yeah. There is a lot of cobalt used in a vehicle lithium ion battery. Yeah. Copper to me looks like it might be heading for a breakout on the upside. Fingers crossed. Uh, chromium just pulled back. Yes, the, the mystified. We spent a lot of last year talking about the slightly mystifying bull market in, in chromium. Yeah. That seems to be coming off. Yeah. I mean, you would think chromium might be linked to the iron ore price in the way that ferro mm. vanadium is. Yeah, but it wasn't. Yeah. No. I think about the iron ore graph, I think here is it's not spiky, it's, it's a fairly consistent, steady trend upwards. Yeah, I think the, um, the Chinese smelters are starting again. You know, they had to uh, reduce pr production in the second half of last year because of energy shortages. So this year um, is soaring away. I think, personally, I think that this year iron battery will become obsolete. And right. that a vast amount of investment in lithium will have been made uh, wastefully. It will, it will transpire. Mm. Actually, while we're on this subject, I, we have just recorded a angel investment story with old friend of mine, Michael Byrne, in which he talks about a, his disastrous investment in a battery substitute. And if you're interested, I would urge you to watch that and I hopefully have that out in the next couple of days. It's a great story. Good. Electric car sales, a uh, bit of a, the makings of an exponential curve there. 
Yeah, but Richard, you know, the, the price of lithium, the price of cobalt, you know, yeah, and it, EV does. is already twice the price of whatever of um, internal combustion yeah. engine vehicles. And, and simply the case, the absolute availability of materials, I mean, the price of lithium mm. currently to go to the moon, it wouldn't make any more of it available right now. Right. Well, it, it wouldn't make it many more available, but it would cut the demand for electric cars. <laughs> yeah. so that's the way that the supply and yeah. demand would come back into balance. Yeah. Um, magnesium. Uh, Neodymium still going up, but it's obviously used extensively in clean energy, wind generation, and so forth, electric motors. Yeah. Price of wind farms going to be going up. Yeah, so hang on to your rare earth miners. Mm. Nickel, hang on to your nickel miners. Yeah. And hang on to your tin miners. <laughs> <laughs> now, tin's amazing. That's an all time yes. high. Amazing. Urban ADM, as we discussed, going up, we think, with the price of iron ore. So, um, on precious metals, a, a quiet week, well, it's not that quiet, really. Gold, quiet week for gold. Um, quite a noisy week for silver, down 2% on the week. Um, platinum up 1%, palladium up 3%. Don't know what's causing the um, platinum group metals to, to move up. Which... Well, on that note, Richard, watch the chart in a sec. So, okay, gold. Silver. Platinum. Palladium. Really slowly recovering. Yeah. Palladium, palladium as palladium Sorry. as you discussed, and then ah, uh, of course, yeah, yeah. Supply worries. Yes, that's what. That, so almost half of world palladium comes from Russia. So okay, so on to rates, and obviously the Bank of England has raised interest rates to the heady heights of 0.5% when UK CPI is at 5.4%, RPI is at 7.5% and the Bank of England is forecasting that CPI will hit above 7% in the coming months. So unsurprisingly, you saw rises across the curve. Now, one thing we touched on earlier is the Eurozone. And I am concerned that as the EU is as the ECB starts to withdraw its quantitative easing and buying a lot of Greek and Italian bonds, that we could see a return of the Eurozone crisis. And you'll see that Eurozone bond yields, the periphery bond yields are ticking up steadily, although they're not at concerning levels at the moment. But you've seen that pre in, earlier in the year, Greek and Italian 10-year bond yields were below those of the UK, and they have rapidly overtaken the UK. I think, Keith, the other thing I'd like to comment on there is that it's, it's also the percentage increase. So the percentage, the year-to-date mm -hmm. percentage increase is 30% for Greece, a little bit less for Italy, and um, I, I, 65% for Spain. Mm -hmm. And if you are running at a particular cost and your, uh, your, your business or your government works at that particular interest cost, mm. and then you increase that cost by 30%, uh, that will have consequences. And so it isn't just that the absolute levels are clearly too low, but the, the rate, the percentage change mm. of those rates is very, very high, I'd say dangerously high. That's true. And if we look at the Greek 10 year, over <coughs> this is over the past few months, you see it's rising really quite rapidly and the same with the Italian. So we'll be watching this going forward. Indeed, I mean, the Italian has tripled, hasn't it, since yeah. uh, late summer. And um, I think that can have, that has some really really potential there's a big potential danger because all you know governments can't simply i know it doesn't kick in straight away and, and so forth but as debt comes up for for um refinancing um 
which it has to has to be refinanced. It mm. can't be um, repaid. Uh, the interest cost is dramatically higher. Yeah, absolutely. And so Italy would then have to start cutting welfare payments or some other areas of the budget to divert cash to paying interest. Yeah. Um, so I think you could see a return of the Eurozone crisis really very quickly if interest rates start to rise. So watch this space. And actually, yeah. while we're on this subject, this is the price of the 100-year Austrian bond. Well, and you'll see, <laughs> this has not been a good investment. I, you know, it got to amazing prices during COVID. Yeah. And when we talk about market equity, sorry, we talk about markets being, you know, very rational, et cetera, and discounting the future. I mean, this chart just completely blows that out of the water, doesn't it? I mean, you're talking about then at its peak, you're talking about Austrian rates being essentially very <coughs> close to zero for 100 years. I think this is, a, this is interesting, Keith. I'm very glad that you, you put it up because it does show the irrationality of serious market players mm. and we're talking you know the tendency is just as the, the central bank governors and the, you know, um, and the politicians and talking about how this is under control and that's going to happen and so forth yet some of the major financial players in the markets are totally irrational mm. as evidenced by this chart and you don't know which ones of them are but you know a substantial chunk of them are mm. and if you've got ir irrationality leading the system, the system is inherently hugely unpredictable. Yeah, I, I just wonder whether prices in the market are set by people with very short-term aims. So traders who are aiming yeah. to make a buck over the course of the next couple of days. And yeah. then, so the prices, underlying prices can, can get completely out of whack which seems to be what's happened here. Returning to the EU, this is Italian government debt to GDP. You see, it has absolutely leapt over the course of COVID. Okay, if you, you could do a little sum on that, Keith, so, so I may get this wrong, but if you say that the interest rate, the average interest rate on, on Italian government debt is 2%, yeah. let's say, then 3% of, uh, of GDP goes to paying interest, which means if they're, if they're 40%, if they tax, 40% of their economy is taxed, then 8% of their um, tax goes to pay interest. Yeah. If interest rates are, goes up by, if interest, interest rates have gone up by 30%, so you extrapolate that out, then it's not 8%, it's 11%, 10, 10.5% goes to, to pay tax. And yeah. if interest rates double, then 16% go to pay tax. But even if interest rates double, they're still only 3%, let's say, on yeah. average. It, it's, yeah, and yet 16% of their tax rate goes to pay interest. Yeah. It's totally unsustainable. No, I agree. And actually what, what this conversation is saying, Richard, is that the ECB is in a bind. They can't raise interest rates interest rates, rising interest rates will cause a return of the Eurozone crisis. And actually, what they want is negative, strongly negative real interest rates for years to erode this burden. Yeah. So they will have to be relaxed about inflation. And exactly. And what that means is if you, if you don't, if you own financial assets, not real mm. assets, they will lose value. Yeah. So this is the UK 10-year, and that's climbing quite rapidly, and the UK will face exactly the same problems as Italy. So you know, as the bond yields rise, the UK will have to spend more on interest payments. And this is the US 10-year. And finally, the seasonality chart, and well, not very reassuring, folks. February is a bad month. Hold on to your hats. Okay. Richard, what were you up to this week? Thank you, Keith. I had a very quiet week indeed. My portfolio didn't change very much. 
um, I had no purchases and I had no sales. And um, I am feeling relatively comfortable with my portfolio, I would say. I wish it was up a bit more, but um, so I'm afraid I have very little to report to. Very good. Thank you, Richard. Well, I had a busy week. So well, you did this very is, well. This is the last two weeks because obviously I was away skiing last week. So I watched a video podcast by one of our Discord members who runs his own YouTube channel, uh, Rogue Trader, about BP. And he was pointing out that BP, 50% of its reserves are from Rosneft, as are 20% of its profits. And he was detailing all the moves Russia was going to was making on the borders of Ukraine and pointing out if Russia did um, invade Ukraine, BP was going to take a big dive as um, potentially it lost uh, the Rosneft assets and the uh, sanctions, etc. So I decided to sell all my BP, which was 10 percent of the portfolio. So that was a big move. And I've done okay on it up 33 percent although you know i bought that right at the depth of covid and again it taught me a lesson i was too early um now also regular viewers will know of our disaster in advanced energy and my new policy of basically not holding oil explorers um, wildcat drillers. Now, Pantheon Resources have a big asset in Alaska that is potentially one of the largest oil fields discovered anywhere. And they're currently drilling a new appraisal well. And I think my new policy is I'm going to sell in advance of drilling results. So Pantheon, I mean, the market cap is already something like 600 million sterling. So, you know, there's a lot of good news already in the price and I'm up over 100 percent. So I've sold it. And I'm currently doing an update, the latest one of our updates on the companies we covered in Share Talk. And Taseco Mines is a copper miner with a big open cast mine in Canada with average copper grades of about 0.25%. So it makes a profit by being incredibly efficient in its mining operations, but that uses a lot of oil, a lot of diesel. And as oil is rising, I decided to halve my Tosico mines position. Now, what did I buy? Well, I bought a load of stuff. Um, I have still got a lot of cash left on the balance sheet from BP. And to be clear, the BP put share price has gone up about 5% since it sold it, as Russia hasn't invaded. But, you know, there you go. It's, uh, that is the price of um, prudence in my case. You don't, don't need to um, make money as much as I need to avoid losing it. So I do, don't forget selling BP. And thank you to Rogue Trader for his excellent videos, which I enjoy. So I've bought some Transocean, which is a very highly indebted US oil service company. Low conviction, that's high risk. It's got a lot of debt, but I'm fully expecting the uh, CapEx to start returning to the oil market as oil prices rise. And really, we need to start finding some more oil. So... I'm hopeful that Transocean's fortunes will turn up. Hunting is my, one of my big conviction trades. And I've added to an already sizable position in hunting. Um, then I've added to Harbour, Capricorn. Zephyr Energy is people on the Discord have been talking about. It's done very well. It's recently done a share placing. Shares have come off and... I've added a small position. Pharos, I've had my eye on for a while. It has assets in Egypt and Vietnam. The Vietnam assets look quite interesting. It's recently farmed out its Egyptian assets, which will provide funding to grow Vietnam. So I've added a position there. And finally, I have opened a rather spivvy position 
in Forexpo, which is a Ukrainian iron ore miner whose shares have obviously taken a bit of a hit recently, but the iron ore price is rising. I don't think Russia is going to invade now. So I put, put in quite a decent weighting of 1%. And uh, finally, it's Portfolio Matters Problem Child is a problem again. Rambler this week did another share pricing equal to 10% of outstanding shares. So shareholders diluted by 10%. And the share placing was done at um, top my 26p, which is a 15% discount to the market. So not great. Um, sadly, the company continues to underestimate its cash requirements. But there is a new uh, presentation out on the website, which if you're interested, I urge you to look at. And if the company can finally get mining operations going, and there is a lot of potential there, and 2022 could be the year, hopefully will be the year when Rambler's fortunes turn around, which would be great. Okay, long presentation this week because frankly, I'm back from skiing. I had a lot to get off my chest. So next week we'll calm down a bit. But anyway, thank you to everyone for making it through to the end. Please, can you press like and subscribe to the channel? And in the meantime, it is goodbye from Richard Wheaton. Hey, it's goodbye from Keith Jordan. Goodbye. goodbye. Full disclaimer. The material and information contained in this podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for making a business, legal or any other decision. We may own or have a financial interest in any securities mentioned. Listeners should conduct their own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. Whilst we endeavour to ensure that the information presented on the show is correct, we make no representations or warranties of any kind, expressed or implied, with respect to the podcast and website or to any information, products, services or related graphics discussed or presented in the podcast or website. Any reliance you place on such material is strictly at your own risk. You are solely responsible for the investment decisions you make. We will not be responsible for any errors or omissions in the podcast or website, including in articles or postings, for hyperlinks embedded in messages or for any results obtained from the use of such information. Nor will we be liable for any loss or damage, including consequential damages, if any, caused by a reader's reliance on any information provided by the podcast or website. Please do not listen to the podcast if you do not accept self-responsibility for your actions.